morning, everyone. Um, welcome to Artist Communication. My name is Sapori Silverman. And does anybody, does everyone hear me? <laughs> I hope so. Um, and I am an art therapist. I've been an art therapist for 14 years. Um, I mainly focus on children with autism. Um, wow, it's distracting. <laughs> Everybody's commenting. Okay. Um, so we're going to start with the thing. If anybody has any questions, we're going to do a Q&A at the end, okay? So first, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the different aspects of art and autism. And then we are going to talk about a lot of different case studies. And then we will do some art experientials in there. And then we will um, have a Q&A, okay? So everybody save your questions for the end. So artist communication. Um, this is just a little picture of what I do sometimes in the classrooms is where I hang up a sign that says art therapy and which classroom it is. And then I put down the artwork from that class. The reason why I do that is because I like to show the kids the things that they did so that they can feel pride in their work. And then it also looks nice. <laughs> um, so art therapy, there is a lot of questions. Okay. Um, so art therapy is a form of psychotherapy that uses art as part of the modality of therapy. So what does that mean? Um, art therapy is a type of therapy. We are trained to be therapists who work with problems of different issues and are very focused on the mental health pro um, procedures. We are also artists who learn how to use the art, the art materials in the therapeutic manner. Autism is a developmental disorder of vari uh, variable severity. This is characterized by the difficulty with social interactions and communication. It also includes the repetitive thoughts and behaviors. It can also have restrictive behaviors due to the problems of sensory input. So when you read this, you see and you think, wow, that's a very clear cut definition. But if you've ever worked with kids with autism or if you know kids with autism, or if you have kids with autism, then you know that this is not like such a clear cut sort of, definition I, this is the way that this is defined autism is defined but the kids with autism feel things they have a lot of emotion they have a lot of social interaction it's just done in a different way and their repetitive thoughts and behaviors often are linked to other issues too so one of the things that we do in our therapy is we really try to understand how to use their behaviors and how to use the art process to help their behaviors and give them extrasensory input or give them a sense of grounding and a place and a safe place to kind of explore their thought process and emotions. So art therapy and autism, art therapy focuses on the understanding of, of the emotional and developmental needs of children with autism. It can range from art development, sensory needs to play skills and emotional development. Within all these components, social skills are developed as well as a sense of self. So essentially with art, with um, when art therapists focus on kids with autism, we do really focus on a lot of the um, we really do focus a lot on the um, emotional and developmental needs of the children with autism. Part of the focus is to really help the kids develop their emotional skills and develop their art skills and develop their fine motor skills, but also just to create socialization and to help develop their sense of self. Um, a lot of what we do is focused on play and art so that we can help increase these different aspects of them. Um, I myself, as an art therapist, have been working for many years. So many different art therapists have different approaches. Some art therapists have, you know, within psychology, just like any other therapist, there's so many different ways to view therapy and to do different things. So really, there isn't just one way. There's many, many different ways. Over the years, I've really developed my own approach of how I focus. And what I'm going to talk about is more my approach of how I focus art therapy. So I do... I use a lot of different ideas and a lot of different thoughts from the different things from my training and from my own experience. Um, so I'm gonna focus on discussing the different nature, the different um, therapeutic techniques that I use and the different therapeutic approaches. Again, this is just my way. It's not the right way or the wrong way. Lots of other people do lots of different other therapeutic techniques and it works beautifully. This is just the system that I work with. Um, so there's developmental therapy, which is basically the focus of the therapeutic process is the developmental stages. It includes social development, emotional development, physical development, play skills, and art development. So developmental therapy is really just understanding the developmental stages of kids to adults 
And it's understanding that there's social development, meaning at a certain age, kids do certain things. At a certain age, as they get older, other things are available for them to do. And then there's emotional development. What are they emotionally capable of and understanding when they get to certain ages? And physical development, like what can they physically do at different ages and place skills, which is also like, what can they do with their, with their ability to play? So when you're working with kids with autism, a lot of these things are not as concrete as what they are with neurotypical kids. So, but understanding the developmental therapy helps me go into understanding the stages of the development of the kids that I work with. And then there's art development, which is Lowenfeld stages of artistic development, which is basically um, Lowenfeld was the person who came up with these stages, which all kids go through for standardized art development, which is we have pre-art, which is basically like babies to like two, when they play with a lot of sensory materials and they feel the different materials and that sort of gives them that tactile interest in exploring it's kind of like you think of a, a high chair tray like a baby playing with their height on their high chair tray where they make different images and you know like they have applesauce on their high chair tray and they're just playing with it and then they see that they're making marks and all of a sudden that's exciting like oh look what i'm doing i'm making marks and then they play more and they play more that's the first stage of art development Scribble stage, which is two to four years, when a kid just learns to scribble. There's a lot of different, there's actually four different stages within the scribble stage, um, but we're just gonna give it as, as a basic um, stage right now, as a scribble stage, the, which is when they learn to explore with different coloring, like what happens when I color this way, like when I color big or small, or how does it feel to color, different things like that. In the pre-schematic stage, which is four, four to six years, the, the drawing still sometimes looks like a scribble, but it has a concept within it. Like a scribble will be a fire truck or a scribble will be the house or a scribble will be something that interests the child usually. In the schematic stage, which is seven to nine years, you'll start to see more of a schema, more of an actual concept of what's going on in the picture. And there's usually a ground line, a skyline, and the other aspects of the picture that make it more realistic. And then drawing realism, when they start to notice more details about everything, and then the pseudo-realistic stage, which is 11 to 13 years, which when they really start to get focused on the different details of all the pictures. Now, again, not all the kids get past drawing realism because not everybody has an interest in art. So, excuse me, I'm sorry. So after a certain point, sometimes it kind of like stops. It just, you know, it ends there. Um, a lot of you are thinking, I don't really do anything more than, um, you know, stick figures right now. But truthfully, that kind of, um continues on as the ending point for a lot of people so when you're working with kids with autism one of the reasons why it's important to know all these stages is that well when you're working as an art therapist it's important to know all these stages so that you understand what's typical development so it's kind of like insight into for you to understand when something is not appropriate so like if you're having like let's say you're working with a nine-year-old and they are they show you different things that are very strange in the picture it's not necessarily an answer for you but it's insight for you to ask and try to figure out what's going on for kids with autism it's important to understand these stages so that you understand how to work with a child so if you could be working with like 10 year olds but they are still at the scribble stage you trying to do something more dramatic with them is kind of pointless because they're not at that developmental stage yet to understand what you're trying to do so you to understand the different stages kind of helps you get a sense of where to work with the child with and how to um, help them and help them grow developmentally. Um, and again, a lot of this for me ties into the other components of where I don't just look at the scribble stage and I think, oh, they're at the scribble stage. I take into their, their emotional development and their social development and try to understand how it all merges together. So this is an example of working with an older child who we were just playing in the sandbox. Um, one of the things I like to do when I do the sandbox is I like to um, put color paper underneath so that it stands up more. Um, you can't really see that in the picture, but essentially you put um, like a colored piece of construction paper under the sand so that, and then you have like a glass plexi, I mean a plastic plexi thing on top and then they can draw around in the sand and part of this experience is kind of like like a baby who scribbles on their uh who's playing with the applesauce on their on their high chair tray they notice that they're making marks so this was after a little while of working with a child um where we used to do this thing where i would 
I would scribble on there and they would notice my marks and they would scribble on there and they would see their marks. And part of the reason why this works for kids with autism, and then like I said before, it's not as organized with neurotypical children where the developmental stages go hand in hand, is because the tactile input for them was interesting. So like, meaning they weren't necessarily interested in drawing, I had no interest in them to draw, but because of the fact that the sand was there, they did have an interest in playing with the sand because that had sensory input for them. So thereby, this exploration was a very um, good way for them to explore how to kind of develop their skill sets and how to work on their drawing development. Um, so we worked over a while. At first, there was just scribbling of like making lines together, then we worked on circles, and eventually we got to a concept of a schema of a person. Again, we were still, we were still using the pre-art material stage, but we were incorporating other stages of art development in there so that we can kind of help the child develop. And as you can see, we, we did kind of get there. Okay, so that's the first stage that I work in that I very strongly um, use my method in. The other approach is object relations. Object relations is an approach in psychology that focuses on going to a safe place in the therapeutic relationship. The ther therapy space and the interaction between a the therapist and child aids in the development of that child. It mirrors the relationship of a baby looking to explore the play space of the caregiver. So a lot of that might sound a little um, off the bat, but what it basically means, object relations was a takeoff of different um, psychotherapy techniques of like Freud, but it really focuses on going to where the client is and going into a safe space with that. So one of the things that I do with how I approach this is I'm very into when we get to the art room or when we're starting an art therapy group, we sing hello. We have a whole routine because it's kind of like, once you enter the art room, once you enter the safe space, that is our safe space. Like once you enter the art space, this is our play space, this is where we work, and this is where development can happen. Um, a lot of what I focus on is, under, is helping the kids really feel safe and really feel that this is their place to explore and they can feel like they're in a safe relationship with me. Um, in groups, it's the same way. I sing hello, I have a whole routine with the kids because again, it's, a lot of it is not just about the group process, but a lot of it is about the idea that we are entering into a safe space and we are entering into the art space, which we're, is where we can work on our socialization skills and our play skills so that the, space can, the play space can happen. Um, the other approach that I use is a humanistic approach to play in art therapy. Virginia, Virginia Axline's work is still utilized today in play therapy. She was one of the original people who came up with the concepts of play therapy. Her principles included, one, developing a warm, friendly relationship with the child, two, accept that the child accepts the child as they are. So those are things that get very complicated, particularly when working with children with autism, because we have specific ideas of what people should be doing. And sometimes children with autism just don't do that. So one of the things that we do is we really try to make it more playful. Like I try to make it more playful and try to make it more, more of the fact that they can be who they want to be to some degree, as long as they're safe. <laughs> um, establishes a feeling of permission so the child can express themselves. Um, which is basically, it's okay to do whatever you want to do. Once we get to the art room and we enter into our, our, our transitional space, our safe space for us to work together. Did anybody else lose sound? Hope not. Um, once we enter that safe space and we can work on development, we are in a place where you can um, express yourself to whatever you need. So you can say what you want. You can do what you want. Once we leave the art room, then you have to, you know, you can't say inappropriate things, you can't be inappropriate, but in the art room, in the play, this is your place to explore and to um, work on developing your sense of self and your anger management and all that stuff. This is the safe space to do it. Um, number four is to mirror back the child's feelings in an understandable way so they gain insight into their behavior. So one of the techniques that I often use with the kids is that, let's say they're telling me something, instead of me saying, oh, is oh, don't do that, or this or that, you just say back to them. So let's say they said, everything is breaking. So instead of saying, giving them ideas of what to say, you say, oh, everything is breaking. And part of the reason why you do that is that they can hear it back and they can, it becomes like a solid entity for them. And then they can kind of go forward in the conversation so that they don't close off and so they don't feel pressured to say something more. It kind of just creates a safe sort of space. Um, and it also helps them sometimes gain insight into their behavior, which is what the goal is. 
Um, number five is to give the children the ability to learn to solve their problems. So one of the things that happens through this process, it gives them insight into being able to understand what they're doing and how they're approaching different things and all those different aspects. Again, I wanna say that when you think of it all as a whole, I don't think any of these approaches for me are separate. I think they're all intertwined. Like again, I'm focusing on the child's development um, and I'm working on their social skills and their play skills and their emotional skills, but I'm doing it through the process of understanding their developmental skills, going into a safe space with them, like the transitional space of the art room, and it, creating an environment that's safe for them, and then letting the child express themselves in a way that they can so that they can learn to develop and they can learn to gain insight into their behaviors and we can work together to kind of help them. And six is respect the child and the therapeutic process. So this to me is one of the main things that I feel like is a very key factor in understanding my approach. One, children with autism, again, their behaviors are not always so um, common or things that we see around us. And sometimes it's hard to see and sometimes it's very frustrating. You're not giving us the answers we want, we're repeating ourselves 50 times. And it's very complicated. You want them to answer the question like when you ask the question. But when we sometimes answer them, because they're not answering us properly, if, we, if they don't feel the respect from us, then they often feel this need to kind of remove themselves further. So for me, respecting the child and the therapeutic process is really an important feature because it helps me gain an interaction with the child and understanding what's going on and helping them connect to me in a, way, in a different way. Um, one of the things that's also a very important feature to understand. Actually, before I get to this, I just wanted to comment. So those are the three different main psychology approaches that I use intertwined together. I also do use a lot of concepts of positive reinforcement, um, as I learned is a very powerful tool. And if a kid is on a specific behavioral thing, I will sometimes incorporate certain aspects of it. Um, but all these together really do help the, and aid in creating a safe environment for the child to learn and for the child to grow. So nonverbal communication. When you're trained to be a therapist, you learn to be very attuned to nonverbal communication. When we talk, we say different things to each other and that's part of communication. But a lot of communication happens through movement, body language and facial expressions, meaning you have to take into account, like if, you're, if somebody's turning their head away from you, then you kind of know that, no, that person does not want to talk to you right now. Or if they're like um, looking like they're tired, you know that they're tired. Art is a wonderful form of nonverbal communication. It helps really create a dynamic in which you can kind of have a different type of communication that's not just focused on words, but focused on a different type of language, as well as the process that leads up to and during the art process. So essentially, um, what I'm talking about here is when you're sitting face to face with somebody, um, you feel like you're in a conversation with them. If you're both, like, so for me, one of the things that I always do with a child to help create socialization aspect of I'm sitting with them, we're in the same space together, is facing them. To me, facing a child, especially a child with autism, makes it more like we're already having a conversation. You're sitting me, I'm seeing you, we're sitting together. And so I face the child, I'll put our chairs to just face each other. Um, sometimes it's more complicated because we're yeah, we're doing something different. So then I will we have to face the table again. But again, part of it is really when we sing hello at least, or when we enter the room and we have a check-in moment, it'll always be that we're facing each other so that we have that dynamic of we're starting, our bodies are physically facing each other, we're there together. Um, to me, that's a very important element. Part of this is really to under is, is really understanding how much nonverbal communication is important because if you think of yourself when you walk into a room you scan the room with your eyes and you kind of get a feel of should I interact with people should I not interact with people based off of different body movements part of it is innate for you but part of you also know that if you give a big smile to somebody they feel happy and different things like that um, again questions will come at the end I'm sure there might be a few okay so I just discussed this body position face to face which is basically something that's very important in, in that sense. Okay, so what I wanted to talk about is, um, just to kind of give an example of how it all intertwines, is something called the Winnicott Squiggle Game. So Winnicott is a object relations therapist. He, from a, <laughs> he's one of the founders of object relations. 
And he was also very into art and very into working with children. Um, so one of the things he used to talk about doing is if you want to, if you want the child to feel like they're in a safe space with you and that it's all um, like the child will grow and develop in that transitional space, one of the things you need to do is you need to make them feel comfortable. You can't be like an authority figure because once you're the authority figure, you become like a separate entity. So really what you want to do is you want to become on the same page with them. So what you do is you take um, a piece of paper, just basic crayons or markers or whatever, or pencils, they make a squiggle, you continue from their squiggle. You, then you continue from their squiggle and they continue from your squiggle. And it's kind of like a conversation. Like um, you draw it like you have to, and from the point that you finish, they have to go onto your, like they have to make the line continue from yours and you keep going on. I mean, obviously it can be adapted where sometimes I do it with kids and we don't go from our line to our line. Sometimes I adapt it that like, I'll make an object and they have to make another object. There's many different variations that I've done over the years. But one of the things it does do is it creates like a dynamic, like a conversation. Like we're not using words. We are just making the marks on the paper together. And it's kind of like we're in the same space. I'm not making something drastic that they have to color inside. I'm not having demands of them. There is no demands here. And it can become very playful and fun. And sometimes we'll tell a story about it afterwards or different aspects. When this was supposed to be originally in person, I was gonna have people peer off and kind of feel that face-to-face -face body position and making the Winnicott squiggle game. Obviously for reasons over here, we can't really do it. Um, but what it does do is it really does provide a safe way for a child to kind of feel safe and comfortable with you. Cause again, you're not an authority figure, you're in the same space as them, you're in the same situation as them. And there's no demand in that way. It's kind of like you're making a squiggle, they're making a squiggle, and it really kind of creates a sense of safety and security in this safe sort of game. And there's a social aspect of it because we're taking turns. And turn taking is a very important aspect with kids with autism. As I'm making a mark, you're making a mark. So the directive there is that they're kind of being focused on you. Sometimes I'll make it even more fun and I'll kind of be like, oh, I'm making lots of dots. And then they'll be like, oh, I'm making lots of dots. And it'll kind of go on and on. But even for a kid who's nonverbal, if they have the capacity to color, you could still kind of do this with them. You make a squiggle, they make a squiggle. And it's about the turn taking aspects. And again, it's not about the idea of who's in charge and who's making what and what's going on. It's more about the process of just being there with the child, focusing on the child and helping this image kind of create itself with each other. Okay, so the next thing I want to, so we right now, we've talked about the different approaches that I use in my, my specific way of doing art therapy, which means, again, this is not necessarily the only way to do art therapy with kids with autism. There's many other ways. This is the specific approach that I use, which is using the developmental approaches, the object relations approach, and the humanistic approach with a little bit of the behavioristic approach. And understanding the the dynamics of face-to-face -face and understanding the dynamics of going into a safe space with the child and helping them develop and giving the child the respect that they need to kind of grow and develop. One of the things that is also very important and relevant to understanding as an art therapist and as an art therapist that works with kids with autism is using the, ther the therapeutic approaches to different materials. Um, this is a very relevant thing to the work that we do because different materials, sure, I could definitely slow it down. Um, the different approaches to the therapeutic approaches to different materials really kind of aids us in understanding how to work with different behaviors and to work with understanding how different behaviors can be evoked from different materials and also how different art materials can be therapeutic. So when it comes down to it, you look at it very simply, different materials feel different, right? Like if you think of it this way, I'm sure most of you have touched Play-Doh in your life that feels mushy and squishy. And I'm sure most of you have touched paint in your life that feels very messy. So all those different materials feel different and therefore give us different feelings. The tactile experience of the materials shift the therapeutic experience. In general, in our therapy, we are trained to understand the powerful experiences of the materials and the therapeutic value. So if you think of the different materials in front of you, we know that that can kind of give us different feelings and that kind of can create a different experience. So as art therapists, one of the things we are trained to do is to understand which materials go with different behaviors or different issues. Um, 
and which materials should be avoided in certain circumstances, which materials can help bring out different feelings is one of the things that we're that are that we focus a lot on in our therapy schools, understanding the therapeutic value of the different materials and when we should use different things. So this is just a plain example of um, this is bubble art essentially, which is basically you take um, um, regular bubbles and you put food coloring in it. And the aspect of this material kind of creates like this fun mess, but at the same time, it's not too messy where it gets a little bit crazy and it kind of creates a cool image afterwards. Okay, so what we're gonna talk about is understanding this a little bit deeper. When more control is needed, you need, um, is needed to use controlled materials, pencils or pens. The spectrum goes down um, for less controls like markers, pastels, and then looser materials that can evoke more emotional responses, paint and then clay. So essentially what I'm talking about is, you know what, before I go continue this more, let's do a little bit of art and art experiential. So I, I know in the email it said to bring, your, to bring um, plain white paper with um, markers, pencils, and um, crayons. So let's try this. Does everybody have markers and pencils with them or pens and paper? I hope so. So take the plain white paper you have in front of you, okay? First, what we're gonna do is I want you to close your eyes for a minute. Just close your eyes and just make lines up and down with the pencils, okay? Up and down with the pencils, okay? Or the pen. Now, I want you to get faster, faster, faster a little bit and see how that feels. Pencils are very controlled materials. It doesn't evoke a lot of emotion. It feels very contained. You feel very in control with a pencil. You feel very in control with pencil. Now I want you to take the marker. The marker, I, again, I don't think most of you had pastels, which is why I didn't put it down there. Otherwise I would have said pastels. But markers are a little bit less controlled. So I want you to do the same lines you have with the markers. Go up and down with the markers. And you feel, close your eyes again, take a couple minutes. Just everybody take a couple minutes to color up and down with all these materials. And feel the difference of when you're using a marker. A marker is smoother. It feels a little bit more relaxing. It doesn't feel as contained and controlled. Does everybody feel that experience? So again, markers are a little bit different. They're not as, as loose as, let's say, paint. But so you can imagine that when you're using paint, it can kind of be even more relaxed. And all of a sudden, you're not as contained, you're not as controlled, things are let loose, and you kind of feel like more relaxed and more exposed. So when you're using clay, even clay kind of feels like that. Like, Clay is like the last thing on the spectrum when you go from marker, like there's like kind of like an expressive therapy um, spectrum of different materials that you use. It starts with pen and I mean, it starts with pencils, which are more controlled. Then it goes to like pens then it goes to markers. Then it goes to like oil, like oil pastels, chalk pastels, and it can kind of go on to, to like um, watercolor paints. And then it can kind of get onto like tempera paints or acrylic paint, oil paints, all that stuff. And then clay is kind of like the end of the spectrum on plaster. Why? Because you put your hands in and it gets messy and you kind of, kind of lose, you can kind of lose complete control sometimes. So when you're using clay, you know that your body is, when I, when I introduce clay to the kids, um, I know that this is when we're going to all let loose. I give the teachers a heads up and I know that when we're doing that, we're kind of letting loose and different behaviors are going to pop up, which sometimes is good because you kind of want to silly putty. Yeah. Silly putty is kind of like the same idea, but it's more controlled. It's kind of more like Play-Doh. Um, clay meaning when you're, when you're doing clay, I'm talking about putting your hands in water and letting the clay kind of get your fingers in there and kind of explodes all around, um, which again can be very therapeutic, but sometimes not appropriate. Because if you have a kid who has, like if, you're, if I'm working with a child who I know is going to react very poorly to these materials, I wouldn't present it to them because I know that it wouldn't be safe. They wouldn't be able to handle it and they would kind of lose control. So sometimes controlled materials are very productive in the sense where it kind of gives containment and makes the kid feel safe. And you kind of know that this way the kid will be able to feel safe and grounded and not, and sort of be in control of themselves. Um, so for children with autism who are more tactile sensitive, a deeper understanding of materials used has to be present. So 
what I was talking about before was just basically your regular understanding of, of what different materials can evoke as art therapists were trained to understand that. But when it comes down to it, when you're working with children with autism, because there's a tactilely sensitive, um, because children with autism are tactilely sensitive and they do have issues with sensory issues sometimes and different materials can really bring out different things and there, there are lots of different other repetitive behaviors that can sometimes bring anxiety. We have to be more understanding and more sensitive to understanding what materials to be used. So very often people ask why I don't use a ton of paint all the time. I don't use a ton of paint because I feel like very often when I use a lot of paint, I know that the kids have a very hard time pulling themselves back together and it's very hard to let them feel safe and feel controlled and feel like they can express themselves when their emotions are all over the place and they are, they're not feeling like the ground is underneath them. One of the things we do is we have to make sure the kids feel safe and feel like they have the ground underneath them so that they can express themselves and be appropriate with their peers and, be and learn how to express their emotions and work on their emotional development. Sometimes with a kid who's very tactile sensitive and is afraid of pain, I'll work with them to kind of get more exposed to it um just for autism guys again i think we're gonna do a we're gonna do a q a at the end i'll just touch base quickly about that one um there are children with pica yes yes we again q a will be at the end okay so save all your questions you have all amazing questions and i can't wait to answer all of them but let's just get through the slides first and talk about some of i could totally slow down the presentation yes okay um so lots of thoughts going on over here um so for children with autism who are more tactile sensitive we have to be more aware of it and again i will bring up the pica part a lot of kids put everything in their mouth and that's another reason why i'd be very i'm very, very careful sometimes with materials that i use with certain kids with autism i'm a big fan of using things like colored masking tape because that's usually very safe it feels tactilely interesting for a kid and they don't usually put that in their mouth and often also we do a hand over hand um, interaction and stuff like that. Um, again, we'll have many time, we'll have lots of time for questions. I'll make sure of it, okay? Um, play and art. So one of the things that is important to understand is play and art are normalizing expressions for children, particularly for neurotypical children. That's why play and art therapy are very, they go kind of hand in hand and they're very, um they very much help use the metaphor and help children express themselves excuse me it help, it's helpful in working with on behavioral issues helps develop it helps develop play skills socialization skills and a sense of self so even though um children with autism don't uh their brains don't work the same way as neurotypical children i still feel like play and art are very helpful in, under, in helping children work at children with autism work out work on different things so I'll give an example even when let's say you're working with a low functioning child okay and you're using just the sensory bucket of water right because like somebody said before you're using a rice bucket depending on the child's needs of if they're eating everything or not eating everything so let's say you could put the water bucket on your lap or the rice bucket on your lap you're facing each other there's a cup in there what ends up happening is you're using this play bucket, this pre-art material bucket, as a way of communicating with the child. The child may not be verbal, but what you do is you take a cup, you pour it into their hands, they feel the water, then the goal is for them to pour it into your hands, and it's kind of like a conversation, you're doing it back and forth. You're pouring the water into their hands, they're pouring it into your hands, you're taking a squeezy thing, sucking up the water, and squeezing it into their hands, and part of that interaction kind of becomes a very powerful mode of they're looking and waiting for you, and they're looking at you and attending to you because you're using the sensory input to kind of help create a socialization experience. That, that's one example of when play and art kind of for a low functioning child can kind of become a very powerful tool. Eventually it comes into once that, that becomes more developed then you can put in a toy and you can see if you put a toy in, will they pour, you know, can they interact with you and the toy? Can they have a toy and you have a toy? And in the rice or the sand, bury your toy together, and then, oh, look, here's the toy again. Hi, hi, hi. Or just jumping up and down. Can your toy follow my toy where I'm going to have my toy jumping up and down, and your toy is going to be jumping up and down. And there's that kind of, there's that whole dynamic of what happens with that experience, which is kind of very powerful. 
that then can go into different experiences where you can have other materials where you put out where you take your trip you take um um like cars if a kid is very into cars or trains where you have them roll it in the ink on a stamp pad or you have them roll it in paint and then it's kind of like they're not really interested in painting but they love the trains and the cars so it's kind of like oh look my car is going to crash into your car your car is going to crash into my car one two three crash and again it's using the art and play process to kind of help evoke a social interaction aspect then there's the aspect of a, if a child is higher functioning is creating different characters like creating the concept of a, of a puppet or a different character and having them play with you through that process and that play aspect becomes a very powerful component. So um, it's using, again, the art expression and the play part to kind of help work on the play skills the socialization skills and the sense of self. Part of the reason why it works on a sense of self is because this is their component of play. This is their toy. This is their cup that they're using. And within using all of those materials, they then can interact with the art therapist or a peer and have a sense of who they are, a sense of identity, and their socialization skills. So this is just an exam some examples of um, creating characters. So this is within a higher functioning classroom. We were creating these little robots with different stuff. Um, and glue, and part of it was to create an environment. So what, I'll give a little story about it. So essentially, I had these little characters that I found, and we use model magic. Um, we use model magic, and part of it was we're gonna create these characters. Each kid had the opportunity to create one or two um, characters, and then the model magic was gonna help either develop the characters more or create a place for the characters to live. So here, one kid took the, their little robot monster thing and they made a boat. And they said their characters together are creating a boat and they are swimming together in the boat. And they had to give a little story. They gave a whole story about where the boat was coming from, where the boat was going to, was the boat gonna meet any of their peers? This was in a group setting. Then this other kid created, took um, theirs and they created, they wanted their person to be on a basketball hoop. Their robot was going to be, so behind it, their, their, the robots were pre-made robots, for somebody who's asking. They were like these little cutout things I found in the 99 cent store that you kind of put together. Um, he created a hoop for his, for his robot to be in. And one of the things, so each kid kind of created, there were six, seven kids in the group. Each kid had a robot and model magic and pipe cleaners and wires, and they were all creating their different environments. And what, what each kid kind of created the different type of things that they did. And then at the end of the group, they all have to present. And then they have to choose one robot that they wanted to interact with. So these two kids interact with each other in the end. First, they had to create their own stories. And then they had to kind of merge their stories together. One of the reasons why we do this is because it kind of helps create a sense of identity. I'm making my own piece. And then I'm going to make it together um with somebody else again i don't have everybody interact all seven kids interact with each other because that becomes overwhelming and then they kind of get lost in it but just with a peer they can then say my robot is coming in my two robots are coming to your robot in the basketball hoop i'm swimming to you my boat is coming to you and we're going to play together and then the for two minutes or three minutes they had an interactive and a prompted conversation a little of can I play with you? Can I not play with you? Is it okay if I come into your boat? Is it okay if I come into your hoop? And again, part of it is understanding how the art process can help interact, can help develop socialization skills. Um, it was a very cute um, group. Um, I do a lot of different characters with kids all the time, as you'll see a little bit more. So this is another concept of using characters um, to help kind of create socialization aspects or the sense of self. So one of the things that here that I'm gonna point out to you is that you'll see a lot of pre-designed stuff sometimes. One of the reasons why I do the pre-designed stickers or, or I cut out myself creating concepts of things that are already there is because abstract concepts are very hard for kids with autism. And when there's something concrete in front of them, it makes their minds kind of be able to hold on to the schema of something a little bit more. So if I were just to give them plain, um, plain paper and say, make something, it's too abstract. It doesn't connect to them. 
So if I give them something that I pre-cut out or pre-designed or pre-picked up, it gives them a concept of, oh, we're making the character. I can then get into that mindset. And it helps kind of develop their socialization skills and their play skills for that concept. So that is why you're gonna see a lot of pre-designed stuff. Again, this is kind of what aids it. Also, it does help with certain kids who have a hard time creating things, it does give them that concept. And again, it's taking into account like what I said in the beginning, which is the developmental needs of, of where they are developmentally. So even though they might be a 10 year old or 11 year old, they're still not at that stage where they can draw like a neurotypical kid, but they still might have certain ideas that are fun to play with. So it kind of helps them. So here I have these stickers that I picked up of uh, different robots, of different monsters, and they had to kind of create a story about their monster. So different kids did different things. Here there was a boy, he put down, this is boy, he had to, I always have that they have to give their characters a name. Sometimes it's very concrete, like boy, sometimes it'll be their name, sometimes it'll be green, or their favorite color, or sometimes it'll be their favorite character from a movie or a TV show or something, but it's, or sometimes it'll be something ridiculous, like something that seems ridiculous to us, but is very meaningful to them. Like I had a kid who kept calling their characters french fries or different things like that. But you go with it because that kind of helps this develop their sense of self and comes very proud of who they are and their work and it means something to them. So this is Boy. Boy lives in Crown Heights. Monster hurts. I'm scared of monster. So again, part of this is also understanding that this process can help develop their thought process and their emotions and understand that sometimes things are scary. So from this, we talked about things that are scary. What makes us scared? Oh, monsters can be scary and I'm scared. How does it feel to be scared? What do we do when we're scared? Do we throw things? Do we take deep breaths? And this triggered a conversation of what do we do when we're scared? So that's again another trigger point of why we use these char creating characters and trying to work on creating stories because it really does help evoke different emotions and understanding of emotions and how to kind of interact with our emotions and our feelings and our peers. Um, then this kid put down a different monster. Um, he made more of a creative story. He put down, his name was Pilot. His age was 2000. He lives in the ocean. Um, my voice is too quiet. I will try to talk louder. <laughs> um, one of his favorite things to do are he likes to make jokes and different things like that. So again, sometimes it could be just more playful. And in, these are two different images of two different things I did in two different classes. One was more of a, a different functioning level. So that's why one, the kid wrote it himself and one, a teacher wrote the story for the kid because sometimes we have to take into account that the kids need to express themselves but they don't have the capabilities of doing it. So here a teacher wrote it for them or I wrote it for them and I used their words. I labeled it for them how they wanted it. And here is an example of a kid who was capable of writing it themselves may not be the neatest handwriting, but it was kind of their thought process. And that's why it's also designed differently, where on this side, I had different things of where they could fill it out, and on this side where I didn't. Again, I'm just giving different examples of how different directives can be used for different functioning levels. With this specific directive, when I was using, diff when I was using it in, let's say, pre with preschool kids with autism, I didn't have them create a character, I didn't have them give a name. I just had them put the stickers down and be silly with it. Where does our eyes go? Where does our nose go? Where does our mouth go? So it's kind of like every directive can be adapted to different age groups or different functioning levels. You just kind of have to think about it for the population that you're currently working with in that exact moment. Um, so I didn't put an example of a preschool kid because I didn't have pictures, but that's kind of what we did, which is I just went through the different body parts of, look, our monsters have eyes. Where do we have eyes? Our eyes are here. Where's this monster's eyes? And sometimes does our monster have two eyes or three eyes? And you make it kind of fun in that way. But again, it can be adapted to that. It doesn't have to be coming. It doesn't have, that's the precursor for creating a character to so give themselves a concept of self. Okay, so here's an example of we also created puppets for one kid. I was doing this individually with them. You kind of see my little art room there, um, where they love making these monsters when we did them in groups. And so they were very into making these monsters and then they wanted to make these monsters into monster puppets. So it was kind of like, oh, what's this month? And then once we did a lot of 
puppetry where I had one and he had one and we were constantly creating different stories within our puppets. What's appropriate things to do? Should our puppets go to school today? Should our monsters, what's our monster's name? Should they go to school today? Should they go home? Should they go to the park? Again, always giving options within the play to kind of help create a sort of dynamic. Because if you, one of the things that I'm just going to point out when you tell a kid with autism, so what is your monster doing? They're usually just going to stare blankly at you because, or what is your character doing? They're just going to stare blankly at blank. But you often have to give prompts of what are they doing? Are they going to the park? Are they going to school? Are they going to the museum? Just because it gives them um, different concepts of what to think about so that it's not an abstract concept. So this was a kid, we explored a lot of puppetry through this and it was very cute and fun. And, and we then developed into making different monsters and different characters um, from this basic precursor. Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna start talking about is group art therapy. I'm not giving the kids answers, I'm giving them concepts to think about. Because when kids are, kids with autism, so somebody just posted a question, again, I, I wish you would all save your questions for the end, but I'll just touch base about it just so that I'm clear, because I don't want you to think I'm feeding in. In art therapy specifically, we're taught very strongly not to give the kids answers, not to give our clients answers. But again, kids with autism, if you give them an abstract concept, they don't understand how to answer it. It's so abstract, and then they lose you. Then you lose them, and then you're then all the safety that you provided for them is gone. What you're giving them is different ideas so that they can hold on to something. You're not telling them which choice to choose, but you're giving them something so they understand what you're talking about. Otherwise, it's abstract, and you've lost them. You need to keep them with you, and you need to keep them focused on you so that there's a social interaction going on. Okay, so Again, we'll answer as many questions as we can at the end. Right now, I just we're going to talk about. Um, I just wanted to make that clear so that you understand that I'm not feeding them answers. I'm giving them a schema of something to hold on to so that I don't lose them. Group art therapy. One of the main things in group art therapy is a socialization goal. And in the school that I work in in Schmalkalino, we have basically um, we usually have six kids in a class. Um, in the class we are providing a state, we're providing the basic of socialization. Just having them sit in the group with you is sometimes a socialization goal. For a very low functioning class, sometimes just the basic sharing materials and space with their peers is a goal. Having all six kids or five kids or seven kids at the table is a goal in its own right. Um, how, I, how I do the groups in general is like I told you before, I started a group because I have a whole hello routine, I'm saying hello to all the kids. And then each kid, we make a lot of noise. We do a whole fun kinesthetic movement thing so that they can kind of participate. For kids that can't verbally say anything, that's why I like to do hand motions with them because that way they can participate even if they can't verbally say anything. They can bang on a table, they can be very quiet. They can make a lot of noise or be very quiet. Again, it's all adapted for each individual class that I go into, but part of that is the socialization part is that if they don't have the words, or they're not yet up to using their communication device, they can then use their hands as a part of, or the hand motions as part of the process. Again, part of the group socialization goal is for them to use, share the materials and space with their peers. I'll give you some examples of that soon. And then after we have an art experiential uh, where we're doing different things together, sometimes it is that they're just sharing the materials and sometimes that we're making a group project, depending on the group and depending on the director for that day. Then we do a uh, goodbye circle where I usually have the kids can't sit for so long. So what I do is I have them all stand up. We go into a goodbye circle where we dance around goodbye. When it gets to their turn, they jump in the middle. Sometimes we just swing them depending upon their functioning level. If it's a very high functioning class, I don't do a dancing circle with them. What I do is I have them process their artwork. I have them all give a presentation of their artwork. And sometimes, like I said before, with the robot experience, where they have to have a group process of sharing it with each other. Um, so that's my basic things for um, group. I'm gonna just show you a little bit of an example. So here's an example. I actually do this with all groups, depending upon no matter what functioning level they're in. What I have is I have here lots of cut up strips of paper. Here, in the higher kit, the functioning kids, the first, this is a two group directive. 
all the kids kind of get a bunch of different construction papers. They color the papers and they cut it up into strips. If the kids are not able to um, cut, they just rip it up. If the kids, if the, sometimes the teachers will help. If the kids are able to cut, then they cut it themselves. Sometimes I provide the lines for them to cut. Sometimes in their different strips that they're cutting, they can fold it, they can bend it. You can see some of them are bent a little. Um, they can make different things. They can write different things on it. It becomes their individual pieces. All the paper, all the strips of paper are then cut up, and then we start to create a sculpture out of it. So the first group is we cut up the strips of paper, and we have different thing, different um, um, ideas. This is a sense of identity of where the kids have their own individual pieces that they're creating. And then they will then come together and create a sculpture out of all the different pieces that they're creating. So this is the different strips of paper. And here is where you get an example of them creating a sculpture together. So again, they had their own strips of paper. There were stickers, there was colored, um, there was colored tape, and then they used the papers to kind of create a sculpture. Um, it's always a fun directive. Here is an example of kids using just sharing materials and space. They were not working on a group project together. I had, I had aluminum foil. I love using aluminum foil. It has a very tactile feel to it. It has a sound, very sensory. I, again, like I said to you before, it has, there's colored masking tape. Colored masking tape is one of my favorite materials. It's very safe. Again, this is also something for kids who are going to eat everything. This is usually something that you can kind of manage uh, in a different sort of way. Um, here you see, again, also you can see the different skill sets of a lot of different kids that are working with the different materials and in their different ways of how they're creating different sculptures with um, materials like aluminum foil and colored masking tape and paper. Again, a lot of materials that you need are not fancy things. It could be very basic things. Uh, construction paper, there's so many different ways to use construction paper and tape and other basic materials. Um, but this is just an example of sharing the materials in the space. And then these are just some examples of the different sculptures that were created. Um, and again, part of aluminum foil is a very good thing because like I said, it has, there's, a, there's a lots of different sensory components to aluminum foil. Um, the visual aspect of it, it's shiny, it's crinkly, it has lots of different fun stuff to it. Here are some pictures of some of our kids where we created, this was with a higher functioning classroom. We were creating different um, sculptures um, using tooth, um, not toothpicks, no, toothpicks, and gushers. I don't know if you're familiar with what gushers are. Obviously, the kids were excited to eat it at the end, too. Um, but here, it was using materials that are simple for them to kind of construct. This is, again, for a higher functioning classroom. This was more of an engineering project, even which we talked about the concept of creating and building and structures that are important to stand. How can you make your structure stand? And one of the powerful things about this was that they were so excited to see who can build the highest one. I made it into a competition. Who can kind of build the highest one? And they were very excited to show off their process afterwards. And this was done over a few weeks. I mean, over a couple of, not uh, after a couple of sessions. I did not make a model. I showed them how to build. I showed them the construction of how do you make something, how do you make something balanced. We talked a lot about how do you keep something balanced. Um, it was really a lot of fun. The kids all got into it. And again, they were very excited when it was completed that they, they were able to kind of eat their projects afterwards. I mean, not the toothpicks that had to go in the garbage, but they were able to deconstruct their projects afterwards. Um, yes, it was definitely a STEM kind of concept. Again, part of art therapy in a school for kids with autism is to help them learn how to construct and to feel proud of their work. And this was definitely a thing of self-esteem and feeling proud of their work. They all got to present and say what it looked like to them. And it was really cute and fun. So again, a group project where they had to all have their own space and be, one of the things when you're sitting with the kids around the table is for them to all be aware of their own space and their own, um, materials and not to be grabbing from other kids. If you want something that another kid has, you ask them and stuff like that. So here's just an example of how the old kids were sitting together um, and working together and sharing the materials and the space. And again, a lot of this was with a high functioning kids. Obviously you wouldn't use toothpicks with a lower functioning class. You have to make sure that it was safe 
all the kids would be safe with the materials because we did talk about safety. One of the things, again, when you're working with kids with autism or you're working with regular kids, neurotypical kids, you always have to give a safety feature of this is a sharp material, you have to be safe, you have to be safe, and you talk to them about it. Yeah, they did do a great job. I was really proud of them. Okay, so this is, I'm starting to get into more just examples of different things that we've done over time. Um, of different things that I talked about, I mean. So here is an example of what I talked about before, which is you're using the sensory materials to kind of create a, a socialization interaction, and that you're using the art process to kind of create a socialization thing. Sorry, I'm just gonna grab a bit of water. Um, okay, so one of the things that working with kids with autism have um, you'll notice is that what's a paintbrush? They don't really care about a paintbrush. A paintbrush could be just something that you stim with, that you just throw against the wall, that you makes a lot of repetitive movements with. It's not something interesting for them to paint with. When you work with higher functioning kids, you can totally use paintbrushes more and you can kind of give them the sense of what is what you do with a paintbrush. But here what we what I what we noticed is that Paintbrushes don't have any interesting things to them. The kids love balls. They love bouncing the balls. They love the sensory balls. I'm sure a lot of you who work with kids with autism, you know that those sensory balls, the balls with the spikes, are very fun for the kids to play with. It feels interesting for them. Here, there's cars. They love playing with cars. They love playing with um, trains. They love playing with different cars and different um, trains. So this is just a basic example of some painting stuff of where you can kind of see that when you bounce a ball like so this is just a basic example of when we use the balls to kind of paint one there's something tactile interesting about it first it's kind of using the art development part of i'm um, holding something sensory something pre-art or something fun something like a toy i'm going to roll it in to the paint and i'm going to roll it on the paper i'm going to run the car on the paper and see the marks that i'm making oh wow that's so interesting i'm making marks and all of a sudden it becomes exciting and it becomes something very interesting then there's the, that's the first step of it that's the first level of the art process here the the art therapy process here which is where I'm making marks from the sensory materials and it's kind of interesting and I'm finger painting a little but here there's an implement of them using um, cars and, and balls and it's fun and then there's the social group part of where you or the social interaction of, of the child and the art therapist where all of a sudden it's kind of like I'm gonna put the ball in I'm gonna bounce it to you I'm gonna roll the ball to you look what happens and you roll it back to me and then all of a sudden you see the marks of our social interaction of me rolling the ball to you and you rolling the ball to me. One of the, my favorite things to do with a lot of kids is really to use cars and trains for painting. And the reason why is because there's a whole fun social component to it. It's kind of like, I'm gonna have a race with you. On your marker, ready to get set, go. I'm gonna roll my car into the paint. You're gonna roll your car into the paint and we're gonna have a race. Who's gonna get to the other side faster? Or can you catch my car? I'm gonna crash into you. Can you crash into me? And again, part of it is using the art process to kind of create a social engagement part of a social interaction and a play component of we're playing with cars and we're watching the marks pop up and it's very exciting. And I'm going to crash into you. You're going to crash into me. One, two, three, crash. And then after they're done, it kind of looks really cool afterwards also. It's kind of like a really beautiful piece of artwork that we did from using all these different social components of playing and again, this is different than the higher functioning work that I showed before, but this is, this is the art pro therapy process for different kids that you can kind of work with. Because like I said in the beginning, when I read the definition of kids with autism, I, I said there, no kid is really just like that definition. Each kid is so different and so unique that you kind of have to use the art process to help each kid in their own way. Um, so this is an example of a group art project of where we just put out big butcher paper pieces and we made handprints and one of the things that we do when I do the handprints with the kids and we, we use a lot of different art activities is if I'm doing handprints I know like I said before I'm using a non-controlled material I know it's going to be a little bit more explosive so then I'm not just going to let them paint I'm going to give verbal direction within it so that it kind of paints so that I'm the kind of the grounding point for it so what I'll do is I'll have the kids put their hands in the paint and then I'll be like everybody put your hands up really high we're going to be really slow 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 
slow. And now let's make a face. Let's make a lot of noise with our hands. And one of the reasons why I do that is that my direction is going to give structure. Is going to give structure and is going to give the components to keeping it contained within each other. Because if I just let the paint go out there, then I know it's going to be a big mess and there's going to be no containment. So I'm using myself as a containment. I'm giving the the things of we're gonna put our hands in the paint we're gonna hit ping on the table together we're gonna go slowly slowly faster faster and again part of it is to give sometimes it works and sometimes obviously doesn't work but one of the reasons that we do this is to kind of give it some level of working together and using the art process to kind of um use containment. So one of the things I want to do is everybody take out your papers again and your markers, okay? And we're going to try this as an experiential, okay? Now obviously we're not using paint, nobody wants to get all messy, um, but we're going to take out our markers and we're going to try this together, okay? Everybody take your markers and I want you to put your markers up really high in the sky. Now it might seem kind of silly, but it's kind of a fun way to do this. Now I want you to make your markers down to the paper and I want you to start off slow, slow, slow. Take those markers and then get faster, faster, faster. Then get slow again. And then faster, faster, faster. I want you to see what that feels like. That kind of feels fun and it kind of becomes a whole um, engagement process in that experience. Um, and now I want you to take your markers and I want you to go make big lines up and down, up and down and make diagonal lines up and down, up and down. And then take your markers and go faster, faster, faster. And slow, slow, slow and stop. How did that feel? Did that feel interesting? Did that feel kind of fun? Let's try that again. Let's see if we can try something different. I want you to take your markers and I want you to make some circles, circles, circles. And put them high in the sky again, and then go up and down, up and down, faster, 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 slow, slow. And again, part of these are just fun directives that you can kind of do with kids to kind of create a fun um, interactive experience with coloring. So that was, again, if we were in person, I feel like I would have done a little bit more of different art experientials, but because we're just all removed and we're kind of um, doing this online, it's a little bit harder to kind of um, explore. Good. I'm glad it's fun. <laughs> um, but it, it, again, it does kind of wake you up and kind of gets you into the mode of what we're doing and the different, different things. Um, okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show a little bit more. Uh, yes, definitely good for following directions. And again, part of it is that when you put out paper and you tell the kids just the color, it's kind of like, what am I doing? I, it's abstract. What am I making? What am I doing? So part of it is the verbal prompts of giving them different instructions. Okay, so I'm going to give an example um, of different, I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to show you different examples of different activities that I've done with kids using controlled materials and some, and I showed you some non-controlled materials. Here are some more controlled materials. So here, this is a sculpture that a kid created individually. We worked on it over multiple sessions. The kid was a kid who did not like to do a lot of artwork, but what I did with them is first, we just colored popsicle sticks. Now, yes, you could use colored popsicle sticks already, but there's the process of going back to the same session, the going back to the same um, materials each time that kind of creates a connection to the artwork that kind of helps create a sense of self kind of helps work on the self-actualization part. So I wanted the kid to kind of work on coloring their own popsicle sticks because I wanted them to know that this is what we're doing each time and that we're going back to the same project so that we can kind of create a, sense, a big um, project. So here they colored the popsicle sticks. It was very controlled. It was, we did it together. We sometimes did it like I just explained where we would be like, let's color fast. Let's color slow. Let's color every detail. Can we make lines together? And then after we did that over multiple sessions, um, we didn't use all the colored popsicle sticks. I said, oh, what can we do with all these colored popsicle sticks that we created? Let's see what we can do with them. Oh, look, we could use model magic. We could stick them into the model magic. And then after then sticking them into the model magic, um, which is also 
clay, but not explosive clay. It's not a messy clay. It's a more controlled material. So one of the things it does is that it really creates this aspect of exploring new materials and um, giving them the opportunity to start exploring a little bit of a messy material because this kid was very constricted and didn't like messy materials. One of my goals here was for them to kind of explore more messier materials. Um, and so then we, then after we started sticking in all the different popsicle sticks over a few sessions, every time you have to use new model magic because the model magic dries. And so then it would be adding more. And then it would kind of be like, what color model magic should we use? You start, you see that we started off with white and then finally we went to blue and it was kind of fun in that sort of concept. Then it was kind of like, oh, this looks so interesting. What can we do? We can stick them up. We can put the model magic on top. We can do so many different things with the popsicle sticks. And then it was introducing other materials. I have this, I got this set off of school discount supplies of, of bottle caps. So as you can see that we have different bottle caps that came up. Some of them are course groups, some of them are flip tops. They were really awesome. And I still, I always try to keep on the stock of them because there's so many different fun things that you could use with them, like making cars, they're great for wheels. Anyway, so here we're starting to introduce other materials. Look, should we use this? How do they feel? Do they feel different than the popsicle sticks? What can we make with it? And in the end, we created this wonderful sculpture. Again, I've done this type of sculpture with many different kids. Sometimes it creates into an actual sculpture of a car or a train or a forest. And sometimes they'll create something and say, what does it look like to you? Does it look like a forest? Does it look like this? Does it look like that? Sometimes they'll say, no, it just looks like fun or it just looks like, and sometimes they'll come up with a concept. Sometimes I'll have them create a story about it. But in this particular case, this was more about exploring materials going back to the same project over time so that um, they can connect to the art materials and they can feel the fun of creating and exploring. And it really was a lot of exploring. In the end, we tried using the bottle caps in different ways. We put model magic and glue. If you're using model magic, you'll know that model magic is not always so sticky. It seems like it's gonna be stickier. So always a little bit of glue there to help, kind of helps. and. In the end, I, it was really exciting because at first when I took out the glue in the beginning to help um, keep things contained, the kid, I mean, to help keep things sticky, the kid was like, no glue, no glue, no glue. But in the end, they got into the process because they were excited to see what else they could do in their own sculpture. So we worked on this over many, many sessions and I was really proud of the child because they were able to really start from I'm not doing any artwork to coloring the popsicle sticks, getting into the process, creating something, exploring, learning, trying new different things. And it was a very powerful sort of experience. And then they had this beautiful sculpture at the end, which they took home and it was very cool. And I was very proud of them. And that was that sort of experience. Then I'm gonna start talking about the other sort of concepts. So here, what we did is we created, um, we took the paper, the full cutouts of the person and we kind of, um, I did this a lot with different um, kids where we would just decorate them and we would kind of create a sense of identity. And um, you can see the kid made a bracelet, which was kind of fun. And so then I'm going to talk about this experience. So like I said before, a lot of play and art kind of overlap together and kind of create the different aspects of development, of social development and socialization skills. So this was a kid, a little girl, um, I worked with her for many years. Um, and what we did is here, first we created, she loved doing sensory play. And she loved doing the characters in the sensory play. So we would play with rice. And again, like I explained in the beginning, there was a lot of social interaction. And where I would pour the rice in her hand, and she would pour the rice in my hand. And then we ended up putting the toys in the bucket. And then I wanted her to kind of get more invested in it. So I kind of, um, wanted her to create her own characters. So we started with puppets and we made different characters of the puppets. And she decided that some of the puppets were happy and some of the puppets were sad. And we talked about um, which puppets were happy, which puppets were sad, what made the puppets, we gave them names. Um, and we talked about what, create, what helped the puppets become happy and become sad. And then one of the things I wanted her to do was to use the concept of the sensory play that she loved and see if 
she can kind of incorporate it. So her puppets like to play with sand too. And part of this was helping her kind of create the play skills and create a story. And again, we worked on this over many times. And part of it was for her to kind of create a story of what her puppets were going to do to be happy and sad. And then the, the rice became their food and it became their lunch and it became their dinner. And then it became not rice anymore. It became this, it became that. But we kind of used a lot of different components to kind of create different play experiences and to kind of work on emotional development. Because one of the things with working with kids with autism is to use the play process and the art process to help develop the emotional development part. And using the sensory part, the sensory materials, to help trigger that emotional component was very important. And again, from what I talked about before, which is kind of going into the art room and kind of creating the safe space and not kind of having demands, it kind of creates that it's okay to be sad. We're allowed to be sad. Some things make us sad, some things make us happy, something makes us tired and kind of going into that process. Um, and then here's an example of some masks I made with some kids. One of the things you do, I do is I have these mask molds and I'm sure a lot of you, if any of you do artwork or any of you are a therapist, you have the same thing where you put the plaster strips or you know, the plaster that they used to make casts out of, you put the plaster in the water and you, um, it's very tactile, it's very emotional in the sense where some kids really lose it, so I don't do it with all the kids. I do it more with higher functioning kids and, um, and I do it more as like a safe space type thing. And then you kind of paint the masks and then you kind of create the characters from the masks and different concepts from it. Um, there are many different ways to make masks. It's not just using the plaster experience. Like here I'm, I'm showing you the plaster masks. Sometimes you just take a paper plate and masks are very powerful. They're a very powerful tool to help create characters and to help create um, different aspects of stuff um, and to help create identities and fake identities and play. And as you already know, because I've talked a lot about it, I love creating characters with kids and stuff like that. Um, so here are just two examples of masks. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk about here is what you're gonna see is you see a clay bowl um, in our therapy, there's this huge concept of containment and huge concept of a container of using the art materials to help create a container for a, care, for, a, for a client so that they feel safe. It's kind of like the therapeutic value of what the container kind of means. So here, like I said before, I don't use clay with everybody because clay, the actual wet clay, not mono magic, but the actual wet clay can evoke a lot of this responses. But sometimes what it does do in the art therapy room is that it helps create the sense of communicating because it also makes your guard down and allows you to communicate. So this was a kid that struggled a lot with anger and a lot with emotion and a lot with difficulties in their own home life. And they, were, they struggled a lot with it. And part of the clay process was really therapeutic for them in helping them kind of relax and helping them kind of let their guard down. And I didn't say, tell me about your life or tell me what's going on with you, but it did kind of through that process of the tactile experience, kind of let them kind of relax a little bit and kind of um, work with the clay and kind of beat the clay out. And then after a while, we started to use the clay. What I would do is I would give them the same piece of clay and excuse me, we would then put it in a special container in, so that it wouldn't dry out. And then every time we would take out the clay. And after months of using the clay and poking the clay and kind of letting them kind of get into the clay and kind of destroying the clay and then putting it back together, we started to work on creating um, a bowl, a container, because that kind of was reparative for them and that kind of helped them allow for the different, different stuff. So what ended up happening is we ended up creating it over time until they were ready to actually put the clay into something like into something um, um, productive and not just destroying it. And then in the end, we painted it. And I got a special glaze for the kid and we put it on. Um, and in after we put the glaze on, the kid was able to have this piece of of a clay that they destroyed over many times and they were able to paint it and glaze it and then take it home as a container for themselves 
And it was a very powerful process to see the kid go from the beginning part of just destroying the clay, pounding at that clay, pushing their hands in that clay, putting the water in there and, and really destroying it and then putting it into something and putting it into something and then squeezing it back together and then retaking out that same piece of clay over and over and over until they were able to make a container for themselves and which was an actual um, substantial thing that they can kind of hold on to. And this happened over time. This wasn't just the, the big, like, um, this wasn't just the beginning, like, oh, we made a clay bowl. This was over like a few months of just destroying. And through that process, they were able to express a lot of their own feelings. And we talked a lot about their own emotional experiences. And again, this is an example of when the materials, like I discussed before, can help evoke certain emotional responses. This was a very guarded kid who was not able to express themselves and not able to talk about stuff. And they were a very high functioning kid and they were able to really use that emotional process to kind of explore the clay process. Um, so we also talked about before about um, using the art process to kind of create stories and emotional experiences and in play spaces. So here's an example of where I use this thing called foam dough. It has a very tactile feel to it. It also kind of creates different feelings. And I take out a lot of these little toys that can kind of stick inside and create environments. And this is just an example of different materials like construction paper, like I said, where they would create these different environments. And over time, what you do is in the beginning, you let the kid play with the foam dough and you let them feel it and bang on it and create this whole thing. And then you put the toys in it and sticks in it and it kind of creates this whole environment. And then you kind of get into the play with the kid to kind of help create this environment and this situation and you kind of let them create things and you talk about the different things of what's this character doing in there what do we need in here and this is just kind of another example of creating an environment with the art materials um, this is just another example of some group work that we did with some of the kids that were lower functioning again like we showed the example before of the sculpture that was created um, um, this is another example for the kids who couldn't create it in the same capacity. They ripped up the paper and there's something very cathartic. I mean, now I want you guys to all feel that cathartic feeling. So I want you to take the paper, any white paper that you have in front of you from before. It could be the paper you colored or the paper you didn't color. And I want you to try that feeling of ripping. Because sometimes that ripping feeling, which sometimes feels very wrong because you know you're not supposed to rip, is also really cathartic. So I want you to put that paper in your hand and try that. Take that paper and rip that paper into big pieces and big pieces or small pieces and keep ripping and keep ripping. So try that experiential for a moment of taking paper and ripping paper and seeing what that feels like for a moment and seeing that cathartic feeling and that sensory input that it kind of gives you and the feeling of relaxing too of relaxing. So everybody take your paper and keep ripping for a few minutes, rip big papers, little papers, and all that different feeling to it. And how does that feel? You take a deep breath and you feel like, oh, there you go. It feels relaxing, right? Um, and then one of the things that you do afterwards is after that moment of ripping all that paper is you put it back together and you make something beautiful out of it. And all the kids work together to kind of create um, something together after all the ripping so this can be worked with different functioning levels again um, um this can be worked with different function levels sometimes it started out as this experience of i'm ripping because they can't use the scissors and then the teachers have to cut for them and i don't want them to have I want them to have the aspect of doing the work and not the teachers. So I had them rip and then I noticed how powerful it was for some of the kids to do that. So um, that's kind of how it ended up in that sort of capacity. Um, here's an example of play work that we did, that I did with some of the kids. Again, part of what you do with certain kids is you create puppets. Sometimes they have no, like I showed you that example before of the kid that made the puppets with the rice and we had this whole process. Here was a kid that was obsessed with Scooby-Doo, obsessed with Scooby-Doo. They used to perseverate on Scooby-Doo, talk about Scooby-Doo over and over and over. All they would talk about was Scooby-Doo. Not, and we made puppets then. I printed out pictures and I cut out the heads and we put them on popsicle sticks. Not advanced creating amazing puppets of various different, various different techniques, but they didn't have an interest in that. They needed that concrete. I couldn't tell them, again, for some of the kids, you can't tell them make a Scooby-Doo puppet because to them, 
doesn't mean anything. It's abstract. So here I had pictures. We cut out the pictures of Scooby-Doo faces, different characters from Scooby-Doo, and we just put that on the popsicle stick. And there was our puppet, and there was a concept for them to play with. And then we did all these things, and I, I made this puppet show theater with them. We made a Scooby-Doo environment, and he wanted his Scooby-Doo characters to have some um, a party and create a and redecorate it with different things to create a Scooby-Doo party and different things and it was kind of like we used this process again it took over time we made the characters we colored the popsicle sticks we put the faces on there we made them arms and legs and then we created the box we took the box we created the scooby-doo environment that he wanted and there was a there was a basketball hoop in there and it created and over time we really used these characters and these puppets Again, not puppets like we saw before, but ones that can connect to this specific kid of just really just putting the characters on these popsicle sticks. And we use it for a lot of social interaction of, what is our characters gonna do today in this party room? Are they gonna jump up and down? Are they gonna dance? What are they gonna do together? And all those different types of concepts, which was very powerful for this kid. Here's an example of um, some artwork that I did with some of the kids that I did with a child over a very long period of time. This kid was obsessed with Thomas obsessed with Thomas. So over time, we made this, pop, like over many different times, we first painted the paper, we covered the paper onto the box, we made all these different things, and a lot of it was trial and error of different things that the kid could do, and then we made a track for the kid to put it on. And again, it's using a lot of materials that you can have that are simple and kind of conceptual in the sense of everybody has boxes now. <laughs> And this was over time, and they were so proud of their work afterwards um, in the sense of what they did and how they accomplished it. And it was this amazing piece that they made. And it took a long time. It wasn't like an overnight experience, and each part we had to put together and stuff. And we had to talk about the different pieces. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry um, about that um, um, and stuff. Oh, my God. Sorry, this is on an iPad. I apologize. Um, um, anyway, and over time, they were able to create this piece that was very powerful to them, and they were very able to be focused on. Um, okay, so here's an example of something that I want to talk, show you um, um, of different things. I'm going to give a different example. When I talked before about the concept of when you print out different, when you give the kids images to help create an environment, it gives them something to go off of. Because if you just give them the idea of um, um, what to do, if you just tell them to create an image or of a family or of a house or of a car, it doesn't mean anything to them. But if you give them the basic outlines of different things, you can kind of help them create the different things to create the environment. So here is an example of where we printed out um, different things um, of different images and we can make quick things. And we had, I had different construction paper pieces um, where we were able to kind of create these different things. And here's an example of what it felt like to some kids of where I gave them things and they were not able to create the environment, but it felt powerful to them. So this was from a lower functioning kid and it was beautiful and cool. And we talked about all the different things about it. And it was still this whole environment that they created for themselves, just not in the same organized format, which was completely fine. Here's the same directive given to a different kid um, where they were able to take these pieces, the same exact pieces, of where they created this amazing thing where they made this very organized thing of where all the people went in the house and all the people made a house and the same images and the same pieces that were created. And again, no coloring here, just a very sort of thing that people went in the house. There was a car, a bunch of cars pasted over each other and different things. And from all these different examples, we were able to talk about different things, different concepts of different what it was. And neither of them are right or wrong, it's just different expressions of different things. And here is the same materials of where we talked about, again, I should say that for some of the kids, this directive was given of, I'm gonna put out all these pieces, let's create an environment that's important to us. What does it mean to have people that are important to us? So here, this kid made this beautiful thing. Um, they put the people in front of the house and different things. And then they made French fries all over because we talked about what is important to us. Our family's important to us. Our houses are important to us. What do we have in these pictures? And this kid made, 
the things that was mainly important to him was the French fry that he was going to eat for lunch that day. And it was very cute in the sense of we talked about it. And when we were all talking about it afterwards and processing our images, um, when we asked him what was amazing about the picture for him, what he wanted to share with everybody, he said French fries, French fries, French fries, French fries, because all those blue little rectangles in the back were all his French fries. And the other things were not so important to him. He just did them because he had to, but the French fries was important to him. Um, here's another image uh, from a kid. I have this whiteboard in my room um, that I use with a lot of the kids. And again, it's not permanent work, but it gives them the opportunity. And one of the things that I love about the whiteboard is that you can put a lot of energy into the whiteboard and you can put whatever feeling you're feeling in the moment and it's very controlled and very, very, very controlled. And here was a kid that was in a very bad mood and had a lot of very emotional experiences that day and a lot of behaviors. And you're able to create this, I don't know if it was Baby Shark per se, this kid was going through a mode at that point when they created this of, creating um, a lot of sea life in general. So it wasn't just about the baby shark, it was about all the sea life that they were obsessed with. And they created this very aggressive image that I found very powerful. And when I talked to the kid about it, like, tell me what's going on. And he said something to the extent of, this fish will be eaten, this fish will be eaten, this fish will be eaten, and, this, and you see the aggression in the picture, and it was kind of um, this very powerful moment. And one of the things I love about using the whiteboard with the kids and the whiteboard markers is that they get to tell a story, and they get to tell me a story, and tell me what's going on with them in that moment. And it's not something that they have to feel like they shouldn't do. They could just put it on there and they could bang it out there and they could color it to whatever degree that they want and tell me a story about it. And it kind of, they can add things and erase things and take them away. Because there were a lot more images that went on with it where he put lots of things on it and then he erased it and then he put more things on it and he put different things on it. And it kind of had the ability to do that. Um, so before I spoke about how colored masking tape is a very powerful tool. I love using colored masking tape. I use it in many capacities with different kids. Um, I use it as a group project. We put it on the table, we put it on the walls. There's the kinesthetic aspect of it of where you're standing up and um, where you're standing up and you are, all the kids are standing and they're moving away from the table and creating an image together. And here's an image of one of the things that the kid was doing where they were able to kind of, we were able to kind of interact with each other through the color masking tape and through making um, different things. Here's another image. I'm almost done and we're almost ready for the Q&A. Just I'm getting through the last images really fast so we can get to the Q&A because I want you to give a lot of time for the Q&A. So I'm just gonna rush to the last few pieces. <laughs> um, so here is an image of where we were talking about anger and how anger feels and what does anger look like and we made all these volcanoes and here's a model magic model magic image model magic image of the different aspects um, um, we colored the model magic and we put pipe cleaners in it and we talked about the anger aspect of it and then here is just my last image of the day of a kid making on the wall this big um, wonderful kid making a um, mural on the wall with colored masking tape and just standing in front of it and you kind of kind of see how he looks like he's part of the image in his own right and it was kind of awesome in that way um, so now that is my last slide and now we can do our Q&A if you don't mind everybody just hold on for one moment I'm going